obviously. Uh, I started happening from when I was born. So put it this way, I was born in Benue State. I was born in Nautico, Benue State. Um, 1964, so I was three years old when the Nigerian Civil War broke out. So uh, my parents took all of us to the village. And um, when the war ended in 1970, I think it was 1973, we went back to Benue and continued uh, primary school. That's all that could happen at that age. Up to 10 years, I was just in primary school, so not much could have happened. I found myself in banking, both by accident and by design. I will explain. Um, I have a background in sciences because I went to a secondary school, Wesley High School, owned by the Methodist Church at the time. And the academic standards were quite good and high. And so they separated after year three. Um, when you've done year one, year two, year three, uh, with all the integrated science stuff at uh, year three, by year four, they would have determined those who are good in sciences, social sciences, and the arts. And so those who are good in the sciences, were grouped in Form 4A, and that's where I found myself. And obviously in those days, what it meant to be a special science student was that you were either going to become a doctor, an engineer. Um, IT was not the thing in those days, so it had to be something in the sciences, maybe environmental science. Like uh, So I actually set out to study medicine. And uh, first jam, Cut off was to 85, I went to 80. So I went to the university. Now I went to do A levels. And then by second attempt, I realized that rather than keep waiting, the university offered me admission in agroeconomics. At that point, I was wondering what, what, what am I going to do with that? And the academic uh, counselor told me that every course that the medical students would take in year one, that faculty would also take it. So what it meant was, by year two, I could then go to medical school. So I took it. After year one, I got good grades. They offered me a place in medical school, but I never realized that I needed to also get release from my academic faculty. And so when I went to the dean, he said it was too late. They were not going to release any more candidates that year, especially if we were likely to make it to one. So. By second year, now my faculty released me. Medical school said, oh, we offered you last year. We can't offer you again. And that was at crossroads. It was at that point in my life in Benin that I met some young people through a friend. And I just found out that these were like the big boys in town, yeah? And one Saturday, we went out and they were asking me what are you studying? I said, I'm going to be said, one of the people I admired so much said, oh, that's what I studied in UI. And then somebody else said, oh, welcome to the club I studied. I was like, you mean with that course I can be this successful? And we said, yeah. So I started thinking, if I had to try another year, uh, my colleagues, my mates would be, year, would be going to year three, while I would go and start year two. So at that point, I was in a confused state and then I went home. That was when I met somebody who was a GM in a bank, yet again the same period. And that's Nebo Isara, who at the time was a GM in a bank. And he told me he studied economics and I just decided, you know what, finish with this degree and make your decisions. Coincidentally, by the time I was done studying, the same man had become CEO of the then Fidelity Union Merchant Bank. That's the first CEO of the bank. So he was one of the people whose career influenced my switch to finance instead of medicine. So uh, you can see it was accidental and it was also um, my choice because at that point I made up my mind like, you know what?
first of all, I didn't know I'm widely admired. So thank you for that compliment. But if I have to limit people who influence my career um, significantly, I'll be doing injustice to a lot of people. In fact, you probably counted like 10 to 15 people, but for, obviously for want of space, I will limit it to uh, various stages in my career. Um, when I started banking, I was a youth core member in Merchant Bank of Africa in those days. And the man who gave me that opportunity, um, passed away now, he gave me a referral and I met the then MD, Chief B.O. Adam. And I would say that was the first person that actually encouraged me in a way because each time he saw me, he would say, did you school in America? And I'm like, no, because he came back from the US to run the bank at the time. I'll be like, no, I schooled in Unibank. And he used to say to me, oh, you have an American profile. I like your profile. You should be working in our, uh, to use this word, in our elitist unit. I didn't know what he meant. So he kept going on like that. And then the other, I'll, I'll tell you about you, uh, what you find out then did. The other person was my very first uh, boss, Dele uh, Ogundigwe. I mean, he made me understand finance much better than what I had learned in school. But then, and also encouraged me to dive deeper into those areas, such that by the time I was done with youth service, I didn't want to do any other thing but in the financial services industry. Uh, it was quite helpful. Now, for Chief Mayan, when that was the period when Jim Kofia was a deputy, he was a GM in that bank, resigned to set up selling. And so Chief Mayan was sent for me and said, I told you I like your profile, I want to send you to corporate finance department. So. I started going for different trainings, Euro money training and all of that. And that move actually positioned me for what my career was to become. That was a preliminary again until I met uh, two people who worked in then New Bank Guarantee Trust. And they told me about the bank because we attended a program. And I found out these were my colleagues in school, but they knew a lot more than I did. So I asked them, what did you learn this? And they told me. I said, okay. I. I drove to six Adeya Malaki in those days. No referral. I stood there and insisted that I must see the MD. And after giving them so much pressure, Father Adiola spoke to me. And that, that was how my career to Guarantee Trust started. Father was like, wow, you must be quite brave. Uh, I hear you were persistent, insistent on seeing me. I said, yeah, because those guys couldn't offer me what I'm looking for. But I know if I see you, you do it for me. And that's how. I joined Grand Tutor. So for La and Tayo were great influences. Okay. Now moving on from there, of course, um, I had immediate supervisors, but I'm just telling you, I'm just shortening it. Now moving on from there, you then talk about Tony Elmelo. I spent I met Tony as a friend when I was a banking officer, you know, and then later on, I think it was a it was a branch manager then, Port Harcourt. Later on we became friends. And I never even knew we were going to work together one day. But we ended up working together for about nine years. And those were very impactful years. And that was at leadership level now. Because by the time I joined it, I joined the bank as general manager. And we worked together for nine years. So he gave me that opportunity to have run a bank outside this country, as well as supervise two others outside Nigeria. Finally, uh, my mentor, Dr. Raymond Oberi, uh, who was a banker and in fact chairman of a bank for 22 years. I met him uh, through a mentoring guide and he had great influence in my career. So I just summarized these are the key people who have really impacted uh, my career and I'm, I'm, I'm quite grateful to them. Principles. You know, a lot of people reel out a number of principles that guided them. But I believe in what is called authentic leadership. Um, and I got that influence from Jack Welch, the long standing CEO of GE. Um, after reading his books and his autobiography, I understood 
that okay, this must be what has been guiding me. Because authentic leadership requires that you must lead with candor. You must, you must be an open book. The people you are leading must realize or know where you stand on issues. They must know those things that you will not do. Secondly, you must give access to both your sub subordinates and supervisors. What do I mean by access? Um, I'll give you an example. In Fidelity Bank, and indeed, or every, everywhere I've worked, maybe you want to, if you check, if you ask, from the lowest person in the institution, if they send me an email complaining about anything in the institution, I personally reply and hand it over to somebody to handle. Because going through the career, I realize that our younger people are bubbling with energy and ideas, and not all of them get the opportunity to escalate what they think. Just yesterday, while we were at this retreat, a staff sent me a mail suggesting a new product he thinks the bank should not miss out in commencing right now. And you must listen to these millennials. So you must listen, you must be open, you must be accessible, and then candor. You must lead with, can, you must, people must know that you don't say A and mean B. It might be painful sometimes, and then you have to have um, that wisdom to take hard decisions that might not be pleasant to everybody. For instance, when I started as Fidelity CEO, I had said to them, the immediate thing we're going to do is deploy a robust performance management system because I intend to run an institution where nobody's appraisal takes him or her by surprise. What do we mean? We deployed a robust technology-driven performance management tool. And I said, I'm not here to sack people. We made a commitment. We're not going to sack anybody. For 12 months, we will run together. And the people bought into it. We had a town hall meeting where I shared what I knew people would fear. And I used a Harvard study I had you know, participated in uh, that says 10 reasons why people resist change by Professor Rosabeth Cantor. Now, she outlined 10 reasons why a group of people you're leading will resist any change you're driving. But then, and offered solutions. If reason number one happens, what do you do? Down to reason number 10. But the approach I used was, I shared, I made a presentation to everybody in the bank, I think from managers, senior managers and above, made presentation to them and said, we're about to drive change. I'm new here, but people will resist change. But I want to tell you that a study has shown the reasons why people resist change. And I'm here to give you comfort that you don't have to fear, but rather one of the things you need to do if you're driving change, you make the people you're trying to change own the process. And I said, I'm going to let you own the process. Why? I'll make a presentation on 10 reasons why people resist change. And then after that, we'll go into 10 breakout sessions. Breakout session number one, we'll discuss reason number one. If this happens in fidelity, what do we do? Number, uh, group two, group up, up to 10. So you guys come back to the room and make presentation. If this reason number one happens here, this is how we'll attack it. And they were so energized, came back, made presentations. If number three happens, we are number three. Um, for instance, people are afraid to lose their jobs. For instance, people are afraid to lose authority. If it happens, what do we do? So it was the groups that came back with the suggestion. So they owned the process. And then I said, okay, you guys have just handed me my execution plan. This is exactly what we run. And that's what we did. And after 12 months, by the way, the recommendations people made, they found out, some people found out that it actually meant that they had to leave the institution. So at that point, I had no guilty conscience letting people go that had to go on account of either performance or they don't fit into the equation anymore and stuff like that. So it happened effortlessly and the board was like, okay, this is good because I mean, it was that great up front. So, that's talking about principles. I can go on, but those were the key things that actually have driven my leadership style.
I, in fact, you've done my job by ruling out those options because each of those actually offers opportunities. I mean, population growth, look at Nigeria and the rate at which you are growing. And then you look at the age, the demographics, where we have the 18 to 40 year old people. These are the people driving what's going on today. The recent NSAS protest just tells you that we're in a new age. Nobody needed to physically mobilize people. This is the age of technology. This is the age where um, if your child sees you carrying a checkbook now, they are wondering what is that, what are you doing with that paper? And if you say, oh, I have to pay Mr. A or B, they're like, why do you need a paper? Pick up your phone and transfer the money. What does that tell you? Opportunity. There's opportunity in the payment space. There's opportunity in the financial inclusion space. Because that security man you have in your village, guarding your house, has a phone. And now he doesn't even need internet to transfer or receive money. He can use the uh, USSD code and do the same operation. So suddenly, you're bringing a lot more people into the net. You talk about climate change. That in itself offers opportunities. People have gone into alternative energy sources to preserve the environment. Um, if you put solar panels on top of your roof and you know use that to generate your own electricity, it just tells you that something has changed and then that's another opportunity. You talk about agriculture. This exploding population has to be fed. Whether we like it or not, our agriculture must still be at subsistence level. But look at what has happened with the Anchor Borough scheme that the Central Bank drove. Who would believe that Nigeria will not import rice, you know, for a year or two or three? The same Nigeria that will import anything rice from, you know, Pakistan and all these places. Um, you then go to the old reliables manufacturing. The value chain associated with manufacturing even offers opportunity. There are a whole lot of intelligent young people that have graduated today. They don't have to be a cha cha you know, that own trailers in those days. They don't have to be a Canadian Electrical or AB Transport, ABC Transport, to do college. They now use technology. Some of them even have models that they don't have to own the trailers. But they manage those trailers and carry on haulage for the likes of uh, flour mills, cement companies. Um, if you then go to, I've talked about financial inclusion, if you then go to um, knowledge capital, now with the power of the internet, a whole lot of people don't even want to seek paid employment. It has created entrepreneurs. These people need financial support. In those days, in basic training school, they will tell you, oh, the customer must understand basic bookkeeping and all of that. Today, you don't even need so much classroom for you to know what time it is. Using technology, there's so much opportunity. So I can go on and on, but it's it's the next 10 years will be interesting because it's like well, the, 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 the global economy is going through both revolution and evolution, you know. So the opportunities are simply endless. I think what matters is for each player to identify where you situate. Uh, if you look at financial services today, very soon, like uh, I think it was Bill Gates that said that very soon we'll be needing banks. We'll be needing banking, but we might not need banks as we know them today. So it just tells us, even as financial institutions, that there's more to taking deposits and giving out loans. If you look at, um, I don't want to use that example, but if you look at the kind of volumes the betting companies are recording, it tells you that a lot is going on and there are opportunities everywhere. But I, I, I don't want to go into that for obvious reasons. three situations, but I might not give you the specific details. 
If I start with the first one, I earlier told you how I started banking. And I was in domestic operations in those days until Mr. Ovia left to start Zenith and they moved me to corporate finance. Then the government, the military government at the time, had directed, there were, there were rapid changes in interest rates in the economy. So they directed banks to recompute interest rates on any of all customer deposits over a certain period and reach out to each customer and pay them backlog of interest based on policy changes. And so, as a young officer in corporate banking, I mean corporate finance, I had the job of compiling uh, those beneficiaries, of reaching out to them, and now process sending down the request to pay those beneficiaries to operations department. Remember, I was in operations. So, because I was now on the other side, my then boss, who was a deputy manager, and in those days in the merchant bank, the deputy manager was quite high. I didn't realize that while I was busy doing this new assignment, he was busy forging my signature. And so, he would sit on his desk because he had data, generate those requests, process it, sign as me, as a person requesting, and then he comes through his own boss to him and he paid out. So, I didn't know. And this was, you know how you look up to people and, you know, so one day, one staff there who was my colleague in operations called me and said, whenever you want something, you put us under so much pressure. We have prepared two drafts for you since yesterday and you haven't picked them up to give to your customers. I said, no, I didn't. I don't have any outstanding draft. And then she, she came over and gave me the request. The moment I saw it, I was like, no, this is my signature, but it's not exactly my signature. I didn't do it. So, um, innocent me. I immediately went down to my former boss in operations. I said, can you see what's going on here? Somebody generated this, and I know I didn't generate this. I think there's a fraud going on here. So he said, um, let me see. He took it. I said, come with me. Young boy, I was so scared. I thought my job had ended. So he escorted me to the end of the hall. And this was the fifth floor of St. Nicholas building then. That's where the bank was. And we went, you know, I started squeezing the paper and said, eh, I need your cooperation. I did it. Can you imagine my shock, young boy? So I was like, this man I placed here is confessing to a fraud and needing my cooperation? Because I told him, no, I need to escalate this. He said, no, 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 that. How many people have I told? I said, I haven't told anybody. He said, okay, please don't tell anybody. Uh, I'll give you some of the money. I said, okay. But on one condition, you will leave the papers with me. So if I don't hear that there's another one, then we can go ahead. So he said, no, 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 hold it, hold it, don't tell it. And I gave me the papers. Of course, immediately I went upstairs. I went straight to Mr. Badesha, who was a group head corporate finance, and said, look, this is what my boss just told, my former boss told me. So anyway, they called Lion Building, which was next door, matched him out of the bank without dismissed and all that. So that was the first. You can imagine if I slipped, if I did not say, give me the papers, let me hold, he could have denied me. And this is a man who was a deputy manager in a bank. And I was just year one, I had just finished two service, my first year in banking. So you can imagine that would have been the end. That's in the younger age. The second time was uh, in Ghana, when I was CEO of a bank. Uh, we miscalculated on a transaction. We entered into a transaction and some unforeseen development meant that we were going to lose significant money. No fraud or anything, but it was just one of those uh, things you do and they go wrong. No policy was breached, uh, but it had serious repercussions. Eventually sorted out. And finally, as CEO on this job, the, perhaps the biggest trial of my career came my way, but as God will have it, um, at the end of the day, it was clear that this was in the other course of business. So I just leave it at that.
high point for me would be the joy of knowing that if anyone picks up the plan I shared with the board when I was interviewing for the position of CEO of Fidelity Bank, and you look at where we are today, for me, the highest point of my career is that those things panned out even better than I had promised to deliver. So it gives me so much joy at this point when I'm winding down my almost 31 year career to know that a plan I shared in October 2013 when I interviewed for this job as CEO uh, panned out much better than I had committed to. So that's, that's I mean, I, I couldn't have asked for more than that. most important anchors, let me put it this way, you know in Nigeria we are very religious people. But so, for that reason, most times I, sometimes I try to shy away from saying what I need to say and what I know is true. For me, the first anchor is knowing that God has my back in this career and it's been proven over and over. Second anchor is that I have very strong family support. Because on this job, if you do not have that solid support back home, you're not likely to succeed. So on the home front, um, I'm blessed with a very supportive and strong family, uh, especially my wife. Because there are many times you're away, there are many times you're not even there. There are kids to take care of, there are family issues to take care of. And if you don't have a peaceful home, you cannot perform effectively on your job as well. So I, I think those are two strong anchors that have really, have really helped you know, my career because um, when I'm at work, I know that the home front is stable. If I were 20, I would advise myself right to remain focused to understand or rather to shun that broad and easy way that seemingly leads you to El Dorado and go for that narrow and tough path that would give you sustainable um, outcome because what what typically would happen to young people today and even when you listen to some music you hear somebody saying, if we don't get money, what thing we get? I think that's a, that's a moral misplacement because life does not begin and end with money. I would rather have that guy sing, if I don't make good music, what do I have? You get the point. If you make good music, money will come. So it's not, a, and that's why you see a lot of fake life on social media because people want to belong and impress people. So I would advise that 20 year old that first things first, do the basics and then leave the rest. this question I'll go to the core of who I am so I'll talk about diligence I'll talk about there are three things near integrity. integrity persistence persistence you know why I'll lump those three together and put them as number one probably only second to God's grace now why do I why do I say so if you're lucky to have parents who inculcated certain values in you. It builds a bedrock for every other thing you're talking about. If you talk about integrity, diligence, persistence. Okay, I have both parents actually represented those things because working hard, and they did work hard. I mean, they had 11 of us. And I saw that tenacity, I saw that. So for me, those are solid, those values actually are the bedrock 
beyond the fact that we need to put God first, right? But let me also put this in a perspective. When people say, um, uh, you know, when you begin to say put God first, people who are like, oh, Nigerians are religious. But let me put it in perspective. The Bible says that I'll bless the works of your hands. So if you're not working, what do you want God to bless? Do you understand? That's so, it means that you have to also pay attention to those three and depend on your faith to believe that God will make it happen because again before he created you for a purpose and before even you knew he had gone ahead of you so if he did that plan and you don't do your bit of hard work and all of that then the whole plan falls apart because you have free will to choose then the rest can come academic qualification of course the world is getting smaller so you must get educated and academic qualification, you don't have to have a PhD. I mean, in more advanced economies, some people have basic education, secondary education. Some excel from there. Others get, but in our client here, today, um, I don't mean to cast anybody, but you know, the education standards have issues. But you need good education. I don't want to put the kind of quality. So that, that plays. Then I hear you talk about luck. You get lucky when you've done your own. So, luck, you can't fold your hands, you know, every day, 7 a.m., people go to work and you're at home waiting for luck. You'll be lucky to be alive. So that's the only role luck will play at that point. Because nobody's going to come to your house and drop the bank vault and say, you're lucky, take it. Because those who went out to look for it are probably likely to get it than you, that you just sat at home and locked yourself up. So. If I had the specific, that's the way I would order it. So I can't again sit down at home and say money is important to me and then I expect that money will come. No. So that's why money itself is, is not the ultimate. You have to do certain things that will position you to control money rather than have money control you. So that's why I will place money itself as number 10 and place those things I need to do to bring money as numbers 1 to 9. pleasantly surprised you know because um, I don't see myself as the best um, we, we, like they say the biggest room in the world is the room for improvement so I am very happy to be recognized um, what drove what I did or I do I already enumerated them before I have this passionate desire to succeed, but not to succeed by all means. To succeed having executed a well thought out plan and learned from mistakes. And that's exactly what we focused on in this journey um, of almost 31 years. I recall some of my colleagues at some point said, hey, I don't want to work for anybody. This banking is too stressful, the targets, you know, 
you come for performance review and people are talking to you like you're not smart. And you know, people just, a lot of people just swing the towel. And I have this thing that, okay, maybe that's actually not your passion. So you give up. But if it is something you have found like a passion, like, um, again, it was Jack Welch, I think, that said, if you find the right job, you won't feel like you're working when you go to work. And that's the attitude I had to this career. I knew that taking care of people's money and lending it to others and expecting them to return that money wasn't going to be an easy job. It's one that tasks everything in you. And so I set out determined to make the best of it. And I actually um, thank God that if you look at the industry today, even if you say we have 30 banks, and the population is 200 million people. And so if out of 200 million people, only 30 people are running banks, then every person who finds himself in that position should realize that um, he's um, fortunate and therefore must make the best of it in terms of doing that job well with all sense of responsibility as well as doing good using that job because you have to develop other people you know from time to time you, people come people go so when you have that opportunity you try and make your mark in a way that will impact others positively